Okay, this one says conclusion, but I do want you to know we're only halfway done with the book. This is a conclusion just for one segment of, of it. We have thus described the manner in which all creating bodies emerge from space for an interval to fulfill their destined purposes and are then swallowed up by space by space to rest for an interval before again emerging to continue the fulfillment of their purposes purposes god's one desire to think action and rest from action in sequential intervals is thus fulfilled likewise his one action of giving for regiving to manifest his love is also fulfilled together with his one motive for seemingly dividing his unity into two desires for unity. These are the qualities of God's imagining, which he projects upon the screen of his vast space in such rapid sequences of changing patterns that the senses of man are deceived by seeing motion where no motion is. Likewise, that which he sees as life in living bodies and death in dying bodies is but simulated motion to simulate life. This universe of seeming motion is but an electric recording of mind imaginings. God's one purpose, which is to think what he is and what he knows into his own image is thus fulfilled. All of his creation is for the fulfilling of that one ideal. Man is the consummate ideal of his purpose. For man alone, of all his creation, can become aware of his oneness with his creator. And now for a few charts. Basis for our structure of atomic, solar, and stellar systems. I'll let you look at these gyroscopic equators which unwind suns into rings by electric compression to rewind into stellar systems. And here's another diagram illustrating the principle of construction of matter by the projection of polar rings from cathodes to collide as anoids. Man himself, however, is but still in the making. For long ages he has been unaware of his self because of building his body. The dawn of that conscious awareness has at last come to man, though that stage also is in its early beginning. It is still so new in his he is still so new in his spiritual unfolding that it is difficult for him to forget his fight for body survival in his jungle days. He has begun to listen to the silent voice within him, however, and is gradually becoming aware of the light of his source. Some there are, however, who hear that voice with greater understanding than others, but few who bear no, but few who hear with complete understanding. These have become more illumined with the light of mind, and their thinking has so far transcended their sensing that much of God's omnipotence is already theirs. Such a man was Jesus, the Nazarene, who fully knew his oneness with God. In Jesus, God had fulfilled his complete desire, for creating man in his own image and likeness. Jesus gave to man that which he was commanded to give for man's uplift toward the light, but man was not able to bear that which Jesus told him. Man crucified Jesus for thus claiming his divinity and for trying to convince men that they were like unto God. Man still crucifies all who come to transform him from the pagan and barbarian ways which still dominate man's relation to man. 
God is a patient father-mother of man, however. The ages of time consumed in creating man in his own image mean nothing to him. In this respect, God says to man, All men will come to me in due time, but theirs is the agony of awaiting. Next chapter, the two, true nature of electricity and gravitation. Every effect of motion whatsoever in this universe is an electric effect. Electric effects are multiple projections from one magnetic light cause. As there is no other force which creates this miracle of creation, there can be no theory of motion or of construction of matter which is outside of the electric process. This in this entire electric process is completely demonstrated in just one cycle of the electric current. One cycle is the centrifugal journey of a pair of divided units from their zero cathode to its multiplied amplitude where pairs are united and the return centrifugal journey to their cathode for rest. That is all there is to the creative process. That process is the same whether in microcosmic or macrocosmic scale. There is not one process for atoms and another for stellar systems. That same process is repeated in every action reaction of nature, whether it be the lifting of an eyelash or the explosion of tons of dynamite or whether it be one's breath cycle, or casting a fish line into the sea. Our first step is to depict that simple process, which has no variation in nature, whether its vibratory frequencies are 6 billion frequencies per second, or one frequency in 50 billion years. Nowhere in the electric current of nature do we find any justification for assuming that a material nucleus centers the spiral coils which constitute the universe? Instead of that, we find the opposite. Nature so stoutly resists having the holes in her coils filled with density that she generates a terrific heat to demonstrate that resistance. That is how suns are made. Resistance to compression generates a terrific heat which cools as suns expand to hole-centered rings such as shown in the Dumbbell Nebula. The same thing will happen in your laboratory if you wind coils too densely. Every electrical engineer knows that he is limited in the amount of current he can send through a coil by the size of the hole he leaves in it. If a physicist or electrical engineer places a solid core at the center of his coils, it will heat and polarize, but not strengthen the current. If he places iron filings where they would not remain in the center, nor could they be compelled to remain there, they would either line the inside of the coil or extend to its poles. If they were tied there, they would become incandescent if the current was strong enough. That proves that the core of electric motion is intensely resistant to any attempt to disturb its zero rest condition. It also proves that nature never creates material nuclei for her spiral cyclones, which constitute the electric current or electric waves of nature. It also proves by the very fact of the heat which is generated there that it resists instead of attracts, for heat is the basis of all outward explosion. The entirety of this electric universe of motion is expressed in spirals. Every spiral, every spiral in nature is centered by whole. Every spiral is a continuity of rings. All nature is made up of spiral sections or rings. The coils of the laboratory are spirals. Every section of a laboratory coil 
is a ring with a hole in it. Even if one puts a steel rod in the core to polarize its ends, there is still a hole of stillness within the rod, for the electric current spirals the surface of the rod only. There is no precedent in nature whatsoever to justify Rutherford or Bohr in assuming that the atom is centered by a material nucleus. Likewise, nature gives no precedent for concentric shells of satellites revolving around primaries in, elect in eccentric orbits on many planes. Satellites become eccentric, and their planes of revolution vary quite markedly from the equatorial planes of their primaries. But they do not start that way. They begin as rings thrown off from equators and gradually become off-center and off-plane. The three rings of Saturn illustrate this beginning. The orbits of all planets and suns are rings with holes in them. The outer satellites which have wound up from rings illustrate the progression of rings on their journey to disappearance as motion. Anyone can prove by the following very simple experiments that there is no justification for the assumption of a nucleus in an atom, which is held together by some mysterious cosmic glue, the descriptive name given to it by eager searchers. Wind 100 feet of copper wire into a circle and pass a current through it, leaving a large hole in that ring. The moment you bend the wire, you also make the loops of force which surround it come closer together within the hole than outside of it. In other words, you make them radiate from a center instead of being parallel to each other. Bear in mind that the loops of force which are spinning around the wire are creating potential. There is no potential at all in the core of the wire. That wire is an axis of gravity around which electric potential is being multiplied. That potential is being multiplied by fast motion around its stillness. In the gravity center of that 100-foot coil, you will not feel an easily measurable amount of heat resistance to the compression being acted upon it. Now, wind that 100 feet of wire into eight rings. Those widely separated loops of force, which spin around eight wires instead of one, are reaching outward radially toward cold and are reaching inward radially toward heat at the center of gravity, which centers your coil as the eye of a cyclone centers its similarly spinning loops of force. The inner rims of rings which constitute those loops of force, are coming closer together, which multiplies heat potential and density because of the outward explosive resistance to that compression. Now test the hole for heat and you can quite easily measure it. Also test it for potential and you will find that that density increases in the direction of the center, for resistance increases in that direction. Now test it for polarity, and you will find that a very thin needle on the end of a thread will seek two points of stillness where gravity is being divided and potential is being multiplied at 90 degree angles from its axis. Then do the same thing with 16 rings, then 32. You still have a hole in the middle. You find that heat potential, polarity, and density constantly increases as you make your spinning radial rings smaller by winding your coil with more and smaller turns. If you now put a steel rod through those rings, you would find that you, you need two needles instead of one when you had but one ring. You will find that as you extend your rings, you also extend potential. Gravity immediately divides into pairs when potential extends from its magnetic zero, 
and electric potential multiplies by so doing. Polarity is that effect in nature which is caused by dividing one point of magnetic stillness into pairs of still points. A zero shaft is thus produced around which electricity spins its rings to create the electric potential, which is so casually referred to as matter. You will also find that the steel rod has no current at its center, but only at its surface, except where it is concentrated at its poles. If you now test it for density, potential, and heat, you will find that each increases in the direction of its center, which is exactly what you would find if you test the sun in the same way. To make a more comprehensive test, and to also convince yourself that the needles are seeking stillness in the eye of the electric cyclone which you have created, instead of being attracted there by an inward pulling force, make a coil in the shape of two cones base to base. If you now try your needles, you will find that it is impossible to make them seek the center of any of its rings other than at its very extremities. If you try to have one seek your central ring, it will forcibly resist it. If you hold two at that point, just a half inch apart, you will find that each one will seemingly repel the other. They are not doing this, however. They are each seeking a point of stillness, which is maximum in gravity resistance to the electric potential, which has multiplied to its maximum power of compression at that point. Instead of being attracted there, they are compressed there as they point out the direction of increasing density and electric potential. This is proof also that the effect upon the needles is an electric effect, not a magnetic one. If you are not sufficiently convinced by this experiment, make two conical coils and put both apices together. If they could meet at a sharp point, you would need but one needle to find one common center of gravity. If you now spread the cones apart and put some fine iron filings there, you will find that they will gather together in a ball and your needle will point always in the direction of increasing density in that ball. You need but one needle now, for two will do the same thing. Now pull your cones apart far enough to elongate your spear into a spheroid. You can now use two needles for you have again divided gravity. For a last convincing experiment, Take your needles to the holes in the bases of the coils. Turn the coils on end and lower one of the needles where the potential is strong. You will find that the needle will follow the gravity shaft and point directly toward the eye of the vortex as indicated in the cyclone diagrams in figures 51 and 52. These familiar experiments should convince you that there can be no nucleus to a mass which is being compressed into an unwilling and resistant center. Where is there any evidence of a material group nuclei in these atoms which you are thus creating? It is necessary that you fully understand that all matter is explosive and that every body of matter thus compressed against such resistance is desirous of exploding. Cold alone imprisons matter into dense solids, liquids, or gases. The Scientific American recently published an article by Robert Hofstadter, Hofst, I can't say his name, in which he said that individual units of matter might prove to be merely rings spinning around an empty point with maximum density at that point and a decrease of density from the inside out. The following drawing and the caption under it are reproduced from this article. The Meson theory suggests that the proton may actually consist of a spinning bare nucleon which is essentially a point surrounded part of the time 
by a rotating meson cloud. You can see by the above that some modern thinkers are rising above the illusions practiced upon them by nature. Try this experiment also. Pump air into a deflated tire. The more you pump, the more you compress. At first, it is like having one turn of wire around a big hole. The more you pump, the greater the potential and heat you create. The pressure you put into it desires to escape. It, therefore, forms a dense ring inside the tire. But your first thrust of pressure seek the outside of the rim in their desire to escape. The more you compress, the greater the density, heat, and potential. Its increase is in the inward direction. Bear in mind the fact that you are compressing from the outside inward. You are not attracting it from the inside. The inside is always explosive. One of the greatest causes which leads to the assumption of an atomic, atomic nuclei, nucleus rather, is the familiar spiral nebula of the heavens. As you examine them in these pages, you will see a central sun in all of them, around which suns and their planets are revolving like a pinwheel. These spiral nebula are all die in stellar systems, which do not become systems until after the collision of octave pairs of rings at wave amplitudes. In other words, an atom, such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, aluminum, or Sodium is a single particle, not a system. The radar principle of nature determines <clears throat> its tonal wave position. Each of these rings, each of these are rings around holes. Carbon is a system, for it is a united pair which has reached maturity and must now begin to die by throwing off the rings which made it what it was. Every sun you see is a flaming carbon. True it is that it centers a system and appears to be its nucleus, but it is not a nucleus which is holding its system or itself together. It is a cosmic powder keg which is doing its best to explore, explode. It cannot do this all at once, for the cold of the zero universe will not let it. It cools gradually and dies as it cools. There is no force of any nature which holds it together by an, up, by an inward pull. Nature does not attract, nor does it repel. It compresses within a vacuum, and the vacuum restores its normality. Electricity creates tensions which the universal vacuum releases from tension. Figures 36 to 40 illustrate a basic fact of the electric current. As long as the two dividing poles extend away from each other as they leave their cathode to collide with an approaching pair, which has been extended from the next cathode, speed of motion multiplies centrifugally and potential multiplies with it. That is what is meant by the Einstein equation of 1905 for that fast motion does multiply potential. The moment the collision takes place and the two poles become one in a spherical body, that moment there is a reversal of the entire pressure principle. The acquirement of polar unity in one gravity center touches off a reversal lever, lever in nature. The cosmic clock spring has been fully wound now it must unwind. Instead of the collision of two approaching poles, the united one divides into two, which continue right through to their opposite cathodes. It is as though two aspices of, of cones meet to create one center of gravity, then push on through each other until they bore a hole right through the compressed sun or other body. In so doing, a body which has been compressed by increasingly fast centrifugal motion is expanded by increasingly fast centrifugal motion. 
As potential increases by fast revolution around two approaching poles, it likewise decreases by fast motion around the hole being made by receding poles. The following is a heretofore unknown basic principle of motion. Everywhere in nature, life and growth are expressed by increasingly fast centrifugal motion, and death and decay are expressed by increasingly fast centrifugal motion. In observing the opposite directions in which the arrows of the nebula diagrams point, do not be confused into thinking that the many masses are turning in opposite directions. Every unit in all of them turns in the one direction which is common to its nature. The opposite directions of the arrows indicate, indicate direction of increase and decrease in electric potential, which is the way all things live and die. Figure 40 represents a nebula which has not yet reached maturity. It is still being compressed toward a perfect shape. It is a united pair, but has not had any children yet. An atomic, solar, or stellar system is one which has reached maturity as a united pair and has begun to propagate generations of offspring, which in turn have propagated generations of their own. All atomic systems are discharging, depolarizing, expanding systems. There are no polarizing or charging systems in nature. Depolarization alone produces multiple systems. It is because of this fact that the expanding universe theory deluded so many observers. Figures 36, 37, 38, and 39 are old systems. Figures 38 and 39 are excellent examples of the regeneration of new solar systems along the expanding paths of dying suns. Their symmetry and their noticeable balanced rhythm are very indicative of normal disintegration. And here are those figures. Figure 36, the spiral nebula. 37. The supposition that gravity is a force which pulls inward from within is basically the cause of the misconception of the nuclear atom. Instead of holding matter together, the nuclear suns of these systems have accumulated enough heat by multiplying it centrifugally to explode them centrifugally. Ursa Majoris Piscium Andromeda, the great nebula in Andromeda. The nebula on these two pages undoubtedly influenced Rutherford and Bohr in forming their conceptions of the nuclear atom. Lack of knowledge of the nature of gravitation and the true nature of electricity caused these misconceptions. The heavy price of sense perception and I think I will begin that in the next because I'm at 28 minutes and it's about to cut out on me. See you in the next series.